Welcome everyone to the 2023 Grow NYC Garden Series. I'm going to do some quick intros. I'm Laura. Um, I'm a school gardens manager at Grow NYC. I am joined today by Jinky, Chantel, Colleen, Kristen, and DK, uh, my amazing colleagues. And we are really excited to be here. Um, if you've come to our be, what used to be called the beginner gardener intensive in the past few years, you might notice us, we might be some familiar faces. Um, and it's great to see you all uh, tuning in today. So we're Grow NYC. We protect the environment, create green spaces, and help people stay healthy and give them opportunities to make a positive impact. Grow NYC works in various areas of conservation, green space, education, and food access and agriculture. If you're interested in learning more about our work, I suggest visiting our website, which is grownyc.org. In today's workshop, you can submit questions using the Q&A function. So if you have a question, definitely put it in the Q&A. Um, if you put it in the chat, it's easy to get lost in there. So if you put it in the Q&A, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the workshop. There should also be a feature where you can um, upvote questions in the Q&A. We're trying that out today, so we'll see how that works. Uh, we are recording and we're gonna send you a follow-up email tomorrow that will have the link to the recording as well as all of our follow-up resources that we talk about today. Um, and you know everything that, you, that we're doing this week will also be posted publicly on grownyceducation.org. So today's workshop is spring gardening. We hope you can also join us tomorrow and Thursday, same place, uh, same time. And by that, I mean, you can use the same Zoom link and it'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern time again. Um, so tomorrow's workshop is ancestral foods. Uh, this is an intro to ancestral foods from Africa and the African diaspora. Um, uh, my coworkers here, Chantel and DK, as well as uh, another, Awesome presenter will be exploring food as nourishment, but also as communication and healing tools for communities, as well as the relationship between food, self, culture, environment, and spirituality. So that's tomorrow's Don't Miss It. And then on Thursday, the topic is gardening for climate change, where we're going to learn how to nourish and adapt your garden for a changing climate. Um, we're going to explore how climate change affects growing zones, pests, extreme weather events, and more while exploring solutions and ways to introduce these topics to your garden communities. So today's uh, presenters are gonna be myself. Um, as I said, I'm Laura Casarigola. I've also got Jinky Nogales here and Colleen Graves. We're, uh, the three of us make up the school gardens team here at Grow NYC. Uh, so the topics we cover will be useful to the school gardens, but also to community gardeners and home gardeners. And this is today's plan. Uh, we're gonna go over seasons, uh, making a garden plan, some uh, spring planting methods and cold weather crops, tasks that are now is a good time to start getting started on. And then we'll also look ahead to what comes after the spring. So before we get started, we do wanna get to know you all a little bit and um, maybe Chantel can help me out or Jinky and Colleen to, if people put in the chat, we want to know what is your, your gardening? Why are you gardening? Why are you interested? And what brought you here today? Uh, you're all probably here for a reason. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people share some of their reasons. Um, and so we just, we'd love to hear um, why is gardening important to you? So you can put it in the chat. Also, if you would like to um, unmute and share in just a few words. We're going to just pause here for, you know, about a minute, but if you want to share just in a few words with the group, um, you know, why gardening is important to you, we'd love to hear your voice as well. Does someone else want to read out any of the answers in the chat? I, I can't see them very clearly. Yeah, I got you. So we have folks that are saying beautifying the neighborhood and supporting the, the environment. Another person said one garden to have fresh organic um, without pesticides. 
Um, someone else said I would like to grow out veggies at home, which I love. I'm gonna come to your place. Um, it is <laughs> amazing <laughs> to grow your own food and flowers, happiness, food sovereignty. Um, someone else said I'm a home gardener, but love the opportunity to start volunteering in parks and schools. Another first person is saying that they have Graves disease and really wanted to have control over the food that they eat and growing them themselves seemed the best way. Plus plants are gorgeous, agreed mm -hmm. um, to relax after a hard day at work. Um, other folks pursuing uh, MBA and sustainability and the environment is their biggest passion. So there's a lot of beautiful whys in here, boost self-sufficiency. And I'm here to hear suggestions from Growing YC since I've been following on social media over the last year. Gorgeous. That's so cool. I love this. I love hearing all the reasons. Um, I jotted down just a few reasons as well myself um, because gardens really can nourish us in so many ways. So up here is, you know, just a, 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 a short list, but I... I'm going to love to read through the chat later and see what you all said as well. So now that we've taken a moment to reflect on why we're gardening, what we hope to experience, um, and the ways we hope to grow, we can explore the different forms that gardening can take. Today, we're going to be mostly focusing and talking about food producing gardens, but I just wanted to briefly mention that there is a breadth of possibilities so if any of these types of gardening interest you, we have uh, done workshops on a lot of these topics. Um, and so you can always find a lot more information if you're interested in some of these other types of gardening. But with that said, let's talk about growing fruits and vegetables and spring gardening. And uh, I'll turn it over to Colleen. Thanks, Laura. Um, let's start by revisiting the end of winter, though, in a garden and what begins to occur in the early spring so we can sort of set the stage. Um, so we've just finished winter, and I'm sure many of us in the workshop today are quite happy to welcome spring. It's finally here. Uh, winter brought us those short days of sunlight and long winter nights. We had the coldest temperatures of the year and watched our garden plants die back for several months. And so while our gardening bodies might be at rest, the cold days did allow us to dream over spring gardens and what delicious plants and beautiful flowers we would grow come the warmer days. And so with the beginning of spring, we're now in a transition season. We're transitioning from the cold of winter to the hot summer days. Our days are becoming longer with sunlight and nights are shorter. The temperatures are warming, but are not nearly close to the heat of midsummer. And this is our season for many garden decorations, planting, and even early harvest next spring. I mean, later season, excuse me. So just a couple weeks ago, our gardens looked like these ones shown here. These gardens, whether it's a home, a school garden, or a container, they all looked fairly barren during the winter. And this would definitely be the case if one hasn't planted cover crops, left any crops to overwinter, or if there are no evergreen perennials in your planting beds. You may even see old foliage left behind from autumn. Uh, this winter, it might've been mild enough for you. Some weeds even grew over winter, which is new for us in New York City. Um, so, but it honestly might not look as if nothing is happening in your garden during the winter months. Um, and that truth does apply for the plants, um, but there's still activity happening beneath the soil line. So under that soil line, non-dormant, soil microbes, which are your bacteria, fungi, nematodes, um, are still slowly working to create healthy soil for your spring planting. Um, so healthy soil is going to be teeming with untold numbers of these microbes that are crucial for nutrient transformations and decomposition of organic matter that will nourish the soil and actually feed your plants all growing season. Um, if you are a returning gardener and garden last autumn, Hopefully you were able to put down a two inch layer of organic matter, such as mulch, compost, fallen leaves, um, <clears throat> before any frost or season or snow occurred in your region. This layer of organic matter is serving as an insulating blanket to hold heat in the soil deeper below the frost line. And that frost line is the depth of frozen soil and can vary in inches or feet, depending on where you are in our, what region you're in, winter temperatures, 
or if you have that um, insulating organic layer. Microbes are going to work to break down this layer over the winter months, slowly releasing nutrients below that frost line to any of the non-dormant microbes who then keep turning it and transforming it into more nutrients for those roots that are still below there um, in the soil like. Activity of the microbes slows dramatically in the winter, but it is happening even if we can't see it. So the garden is still alive. Um, many or microbes are dormant in the winter though, but they will become active once the temperature starts to warm in spring, so right about now. So you, if you are just starting a new garden this spring and late autumn soil prep didn't happen for you, don't worry, not too late. Um, and Cynthia in a little bit will go through sort of the how-to of bed preparation um, to get you started. Next, please. Thanks. Um, it's also important to know when the, your last frost date is for your area, as that will inform your planting schedules. We can't just get out right now and plant necessarily. The frost date is the average date for the last light freeze of spring. And you don't wanna to plant too early outside because a late frost can actually kill your tender plants. And you can find a variety of websites that can assist you in finding your local frost day. For today, I consulted the Old Farmers um, Almanac to see what they're predicting for New York City. And given our mild winter, the last frost day you can see is predicted for April 3rd, which is next week and pretty crazy for us. Um, typically though, we still reliably use mid-April as a last frost date. Um, we may not get a true frost even after next Monday, but gardeners here, you can, re you can plan reliably to have some really cool nights still maybe even into May. Um, but you can use this date to also plan when to plant your cool season crops. And Laura, it will highlight um, exactly what those are later on and options as well for keeping your early plants warm during those cool spells. So it's not impossible to garden yet. It's just, you need to be mindful. Um, and for me personally, this frost date really does act as the start line of a race. I mean, I plan my planting around it and it's a date that really gives me permission to start digging again. And it really makes me excited. Um, so with that frost date approaching Monday, um, the period of rest for the garden is ending and we're entering the season of growth as we welcome the spring. There are signs of life emerging in the gardens. As you can, everyone can see, there are fresh leaves unfurling, the early spring bulbs are blooming, the trees are budding. Um, the soil is beginning to thaw and warm up from the long cold. Um, dormant microbes are also awakening and beginning their frenzied work of becoming nitrogen and phosphorus fixers. Um, that work is gonna continue through the whole growing season and will keep our soils healthy and feed our roots. Um, so spring is a time when gardeners start to physically get busy and put our action um, into action our winter dreams. And I'm gonna actually pass it to Jinky now to talk about those dreams. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so one of the best things to do to have a successful growing season is to plan out what you wanna grow. And this is where a little research and coordination will come in. So when making your garden plan, you want to ask yourself these questions. What do I want to grow? If you're anything like me, you guys will want to grow anything and everything. I look through these seed catalogs and my eyes just grow big. <laughs> um, I love planting. But because I have such a limited space in my garden, I have to decide on what to grow for this year. I can always try something new next year. Right? Um, second question is, when do you need to plant it? Each plant will have its own time frame of growing, from sowing the seeds to germination to harvest. You want to know how long it'll take for your plant to produce your edibles so you can harvest before the growing season is over and the fall frost has come. Right? You'll also want to know what you can grow alongside a particular plant. Some plants can actually benefit other plants, and to maximize space, you can grow them together. Last consideration is where in the garden can you plant it? Will your plant need a lot of sun or can it tolerate some shade? Most veggies um, will require six to eight hours of direct sunlight, so you wanna keep that in mind. So based on what you wanna grow, you'll need to do some research to answer these questions. 
Usually the back of the seed packages or seed catalogs will give you the information you need to know. And you can also look it up in the internet. Next slide. So if you are pursuing an edible garden this spring, this chart from the Cornell Cooperative Extension is a great overview of the months from February to October. When, um, an, and it's an overview of when to start seeds indoors versus outdoors and when to transplant. Um, it even shows when to plant your winter cover crops that add in nutrients to the soil and keeps it healthy over the cold season. So again, this is a brief overview, but it does illustrate the activity, that activity can occur year round. This also helps you have a frame of reference for your seed starting and sowing period. For those who are more interested in flower gardens, you can direct sow. So just put your seed into the ground once that last frost day has occurred or even transplant seed starts from your local garden nursery. As Colleen mentioned, the last frost date has moved up to April 3rd instead of mid-April. So uh, maybe we can start planting next week. A handy tool to help gardeners identify when to start indoors versus outdoors is this planting calendar for each season. Right? For example, this is a spring planting calendar for vegetables and herbs. We have highlighted basil as an example of information you're looking for to contrast days between direct seed, DS in parentheses, and those that are transplanted, capital T. So looking at that orange box, if you direct sow the basil seeds outdoors, you will do that mid-April, and it takes about 70 days to maturity so you will harvest your first basil batch around July 4th. In the green box right below it, if transplant, transplanting seedlings from seeds that, have, that were started indoors, you can sow those seeds in containers March 6th, transplant mid-April after the traditional last frost date, and then harvest mid-June. So you see you just shaved off a couple of weeks off of the whole planting process. Um, we'll share links to both the spring and fall planting calendars as part of the shared resources in our follow-up email. Great. So earlier we asked ourselves what can grow next to each other. This is called companion planting. This method not only maximizes your space, but when certain plants are grown together, they can benefit from one another. Right? For example, basil can enhance the flavor of tomatoes and peppers. Um, little story, when my students and I design our garden beds, we call this the pizza bed because we use all three ingredients in pre pizza. And we also create like a pico de gallo bed with tomatoes, onions, cilantro, jalapeno. So you can be creative, have fun thinking about what you can grow together and name your garden bed. <laughs> um, you also want to be mindful that certain combinations of plants can interfere with the growth of another plant. Tomatoes will grow well with basil and pepper, but they just like potato and fennel. So be aware of garden friends and beware of garden enemies. So here's a, a quick list that Cornell Cooperative Extension compiled of a few plant combinations that gardeners have long, long recommended. You'll see what crops are companions and you'll see what um, those that are incompatible. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so for continuous supply of fresh homegrown produce, you can develop a succession plan and enjoy multiple harvests from a single patch of ground in any given growing season. So usually in spring, this is more common for the quick growing plants. So this is done by planting a crop immediately after an earlier crop has been picked to keep the harvest coming. Um, you are planting two or more crops in succession. So it's one right after the other. Like I said, some crops have a fairly short growing season 
and there's time to plant more of the same crop or another quick growing crop after harvest. For example, radishes, they're ready to harvest in about three weeks. You can plant more radishes after the first set has been harvested or plant something else like lettuce, which is another crop that has a fairly short season. Um, growing like this not only maximizes productivity, ensuring more for you to eat, but maintaining soil cover with the leaves and roots of crops for providing fewer opportunities for weeds while protecting the ground cover from erosion caused by wind and heavy rain or snow. Next slide. Great, so another planting practice is crop rotation. It's a good idea to rotate your crops in your beds from year to year. This practice of planting different crops sequentially on the same plot of land improves soil health. It optimizes nutrients in your soil and it combats pests and weeds. Um, this table shows what is being grown in the same garden bed over a span of four years. So you can see that the veggies will change every season and every year. Again, this rotation of crops increases nutrient cycling um, and nutrient use by the crops that are growing in there. It disrupts plant disease and pest cycles. It reduces soil erosion and increases soil health. Now I'm going to pass it back to Laura and she'll talk about some methods. Yes, great. Thank you. So now that we've thought about seasonal timeline, we've done some planning. If you're an artist, maybe you've mapped out and drawn in the little veggies that you're going to do in each of your garden beds or containers. Let's explore some, some more spring planting methods. Um, the methods that you use will also depend on what you're planting in. The three most popular options are planting directly in the ground, in raised beds, or in containers. Um, but you have to keep in mind that city soil likely has contaminants that can be harmful. So we always advise that if, if you're going to plant directly in the ground to do only non-edible plants like flowers, native plants, pollinator plants, Shade gardens and rain gardens are also a good idea. Um, in raised beds and containers, you can plant all of those things as well, um, but you can also do your food producing plants um, in you know, a clean soil that you can trust. Let's talk a little bit about seed starting because you may wanna start your own seeds indoors um, to transplant later on. This is great because you can extend the growing season, get a, a jump start on it, um, you know, our growing season here in New York City is, is fairly short, so it always helps to get a little head start on it. Starting seeds is also educational, and it's pretty cool to see something go all the way from a seed onto your plate. Um, it uh, also allows folks to explore heirloom varieties and engage in seed keeping to help increase biodiversity um, and can also be a really important ancestral practice as well. And lastly, it can also be really cost effective. You can get a lot of seedlings out of one seed packet. These are the pros of seed starting, but there are also considerations because it requires an indoor space to do it and enough sunlight or a grow light and time. So you can weigh the pros and cons for yourself and decide if you wanna start your own seedlings or purchase transplants later on. Or the other option is to direct sow your seeds directly in the soil. A lot of gardeners end up doing a combination of direct sowing and planting transplants. Certain plants um, do not like to be transplanted. For example, carrots, peas, and spinach. They have delicate root systems, so it's best to direct sow to keep their roots from being disturbed. Often your seed packet will tell you if you can direct sow or start the seeds indoors. Um, some plants you can do either method. So it just takes a little research because it does depend on the plant as well as you know, what you wanna do. As promised, here are some, uh, just a list of cold weather crops. It's not exhaustive, but we just threw a few on there for you. Um, what makes them cold weather crops is that they're resistant to light freezes and cold temperatures. Some of them even prefer or thrive in those colder conditions. 
For example, um, carrots, kale, spinach, and Brussels sprouts convert their starches to sugar to keep themselves from freezing, and that makes them taste even sweeter and more delicious. So spring is a great time to grow those types of things. And to get growing early in spring, you can also utilize some techniques to extend your growing season. So I have pictured here high tunnel, a low tunnel, and a very simple cold frame. And all of these provide an added layer of protection from the weather. And you can get as fancy or as simple as you want when it comes to these. Uh, the simplest thing is throwing some fleecy row cover or a piece of glass, even plastic sheeting with some holes poked in it. Throwing that over a container is super simple. And if you plant next week and then all of a sudden we get, you know, the forecast says it's going to be 20 degrees outside one night, you, you're going to want to protect your plants in some way. So that kind of leads us into some common spring pitfalls. We've gone over a lot of techniques and info um, so far. You know, we're all learning a lot here. I would consider myself a somewhat experienced gardener. And what that also means is that I've had my fair share of pitfalls or what some might call garden fails, um, but we could also frame them as opportunities to learn. So here, you know, I kind of mentioned already the planting crops too soon. Um, you know, I'm not psychic. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we do our best to plant when it makes sense. But sometimes, you, you know, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. So that's why those um, season extension techniques can really, can really help. Um, if you want to be extra safe and you're not in a huge rush, you could wait a couple of weeks after the frost date to plant. Another common spring pitfall is failing to harden off your transplants. And what that means is sometimes you'll buy a transplant or you'll start yours indoors. Um, and then when you bring it outside and plant it, it just dies immediately and gets sick. And that's because those really young tender plants are not used to being in the outdoor conditions. So there's a whole process called hardening off where you gradually expose them to the outdoor conditions before you, you know, really push them out of the nest. So that's something you can learn a lot about in our, our seed starting workshop um, on our website. The next one is planting old seeds. It's so tempting, um, like we got a seed donation uh, of some old seeds a couple of years ago, and we had to, to decide, are we gonna plant these or are they too old? And it really depends on the seed. There are certain uh, types of plants that their seeds have a very long shelf life, like five or six years. And some seeds will only be good for like one year. So it depends on the seeds. Um, if they are expired, don't write them off yet. You can do this little test that we did with ours, which is you take 10 seeds um, and you put them on a wet paper towel and you place it in a container like a Tupperware and wait a few days to see how many of them start to germinate or sprout. And we found that a lot of those seeds that had you know, an expiration date or a sell-by date from a couple of years ago, they actually still had a great germination rate but some of them did not. So you just wanna be aware of that. The last one I'll mention is overcrowding plants, which is another temptation. Um, when you bring your plants home or you got your fresh packet of seeds and you just wanna grow as much as you possibly can. So sometimes they get, we, we ignore what the directions say in terms of how much space they need. But if you really wanna give your plants their best a case scenario, you do want to leave them with enough space to grow. And so if you're getting transplants, they'll usually have a recommendation for how much space the fully grown plant is going to need. Um, and if you're planting seeds, you probably are going to plant a lot of them in one row, and you're going to have to go through and thin them out uh, later on. And um, that's because overcrowding creates competition for the nutrients and the sun. So it's best to just give the plants the space that they really need to thrive. All right, this one's for you, Jinky. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, so since we are a school gardens program and I teach a garden science class on the side, I have to mention some tips for aligning your growing calendar with the school calendar. 
this is also great even if you're not gardening at a school because it'll give you ideas for quick growing plants and creative ways to work within your own schedule, whatever it may be. Next slide. Okay, so sometimes we hear that it's too bad kids aren't in school when most of the crops peak in the summer. This may be true for hot weather crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, and blueberries, but there are many tasty and nutritious crops that are grown in the spring or fall when classes are in session. Think of those cool weather crops that Laura mentioned earlier. Um, unique learning opportunities can happen within the school calendar year. Fall and spring are excellent times to learn about cover crops and can teach children the importance of covering that soil to protect it from erosive winter wind and heavy snow. Hence the name cover crops, you're covering that soil. Um, they are grown specifically to improve or protect the soil and often do not produce a harvestable edible crop. Um, school season plants can also teach students about season extension techniques, such as those high low tunnels that Laura mentioned. Growing in the spring and fall offer the opportunity of teaching students about the health and economic benefits of eating vegetables and fruits in season when they are most abundant, they're tastier, they're grown locally, and least expensive versus that high price out of season crops can demand. Um, for example, like buying and eating strawberries in December here. So those strawberries were probably um, from California. Um, so this is an opportunity for students to learn about the cost of having that strawberry shipped across the country, and not to mention the carbon footprint that it leaves behind, right? Um, there's also the opportunity to teach that growing these crops during the cooler parts of the season avoids problems that plague them during the hotter summer months. Um, I think Doug asked this question about the broccoli. So broccoli in the summer when temperatures rise, they don't grow as well because it's actually a flower and they'll bolt and they'll send up those flowers, meaning they're ready to reproduce. Um, so that's why broccoli isn't really a good crop to grow during those summer months. There are varieties that um, keep them from bolting, but traditionally broccoli is a cool weather plant. Um, and the next slide will show you some quick victory crops that grow well within the school year. Great. Oh, so this is one. <laughs> so you may notice these Quick victory crops are very similar to the cool weather crops. Um, there's some overlap because these are what grow best and the fastest during the fall and spring when classes are in session. So you can plant right now and then you can have students harvest before they leave in June. All right, so I know you're all itching to get your hands in the soil and it's spring and you've seen what can grow during these still fairly cold days but you have to get your garden prepped before digging into that soil. So let's look at some tasks before you start putting your seeds or seedlings into the ground. The first task is to tune up your tools. In case you didn't store them properly for winter, give your tools some love and attention so they're in tip top shape when it's time to work. Give them a good wipe down, check for rest. Pruners would probably benefit from a sharpening Sanitize them and loppers as well with isopropyl alcohol before trimming anything. So this prevents plants from being infected if another plant trimmed with the same tool is diseased. Um, lastly, make note of what is missing and order tools if needed for the new growing season. Next, you'll want to test your soil. Is it ready for planting? If you haven't tested your soil in a while, now is a good time to do so. Soil should be tested for pH and nutrient levels about once every three years. It's easily done using a home test kit. You can buy at any garden supply center, or if you think there are contaminants, send it out to a lab. Um, Brooklyn College has a great soil testing lab, so you can send it there. Fertilize to revitalize. 
You want to amend your soil with an inch or two worth of compost. Compost is recommended rather than chemical fertilizers because not only does compost have vital nutrients for plants, it also improves soil structure and it contains beneficial mi microorganisms that can protect plants from pests and disease. Um, just to note, if you planted a winter cover crop, now is the time to cut them down and till it into the soil in preparation for planting in beds. And check your soil for saturation. You don't want a soupy, goopy mess. Um, you can do what you can do to test it is grab a handful of your garden soil. If you can like form it into a ball and it stays, the soil is a little too wet for planting. There is a good chance that your seeds might rot um, and it prevents it from germinating. Germinating. If it crumbles through your fingers, then it's ready for planting. Also, check the soil temperature. Seeds um, need soil to be at least 45 degrees Fahrenheit to germinate, but this can vary slightly depending on the seeds. Next slide. Great. Colleen mentioned bed prep earlier. You'll want to inspect your raised garden beds for any damage, especially if they're made of wood. Over the winter, soggy soil from rain and snow can put a strain on the wood frames of a raised garden bed. You want to make sure all your beds are structurally sound and ready to house plants and more soil. Um, weeding. Remove those pesky early spring weeds before they get too comfortable in your garden. It's easier to pull them out when they're still, you know, just popping out. The key to successful weeding is to really start early and then stay on top of it. Lastly, if your level of soil in your garden beds are looking a little low, you'll want to add more soil and compost. And we're gonna see Sean from the teaching garden on Governor's Island. He's gonna prep the beds at the teaching garden. The sun is out, the birds are chirping, the daffodils are in bloom. It's that time of year. Time to start preparing the garden beds for the season ahead. Let's do it. Our first stop is the compost pile, where we fill a wheelbarrow full of this nutrient-rich soil amendment. Two pallets of topsoil just arrived in time for us to prep our beds. Let's go unload it. So we have our bag soil, we have beautiful compost from our friends over at Earth Matter. It's time to start preparing this bed. Let's do it. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> so as you can see, um, Sean kind of moved the soil around before adding the compost and the topsoil and then mixed it and leveled it out. Adding topsoil isn't always necessary, but if your beds are low on soil, you'll want to add more. Okay. All right. Watering options. We wanted to give you some watering options because water is an essential need for all plants to thrive and grow. 
us too. <laughs> Some options are using the traditional hose and sprayer pictured on the top right corner there. Um, drip irrigation or soaker hoses on the left. The sub irrigated or self watering planters in the middle. And what that does is there's a water reservoir at the bottom of the container, so roots reach down, making for a stronger plant. Okay? And lastly, um, the self-watering oya on the bottom left there. So these clay pots are buried in the soil, and then you fill with water. Because the clay is porous, the water will slowly seep out, watering your plants surrounding it. Um, you can check out our school gardens handbook for the pros and considerations of each type of watering system to figure out what works best for your garden. And now looking ahead, we're gonna give it back to Colleen. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jinky. For this last section um, of our chat today, before we get to the q and I'll focus just on a few areas to keep in mind as the spring months advance and we close in on summer. Um, so during the growing season, a gardener is never at rest, every, even once your plants are in. There's so much to keep you busy as you care for your garden to ensure a successful growing season and harvest. Um, if you do plan on succession planting, make sure you're ready to either seed start or sow those seeds in a few weeks. Um, and remember what Jinky discussed about succession planting and consult those resources. Um, you wanna watch who's visiting your garden. Are pollinators and friendly beneficial insects flying around? We want our native pollinators, bees, wasps, butterflies, moths, you name it, um, to visit. They're crucial to our food cycle as without them dusting the pollen around, our food producing plants just won't fruit. Be on the lookout and watch for them to dance around your plants. If you don't see anyone coming to visit, consider including pollinator attracting native plants to your garden. Um, they will follow the plants and flowers and thus visit your crops. And the more you can plant to attract them, the better for your garden and our larger native pollinator network. Um, but also be on the lookout who's visiting um, because not every creature is beneficial. Some are more than happy to feast freely on your plants that you're attending. They will see your garden as an all day buffet, um, all night too. Uh, so make a plan to routinely check your plants, even under the leaves to see who's laying eggs. Various diseases can also spring up to wreak havoc they could be a direct result of the pest, but sometimes the environment has created the issue, whether it's our watering techniques or if a pathogen is somehow in the soils. You will quickly begin to see damage from these pests and diseases as the leaves, stems, and fruits will reveal it. If you see the problem happening, work to identify it quickly so that you can choose a management solution following some practices of integrated pest management. IPM, for those who don't know, is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on, on long-term prevention of the pests using biological controls, habitat manipulation, modification of your own practice, and using resistant plant varieties. Um, that's a whole nother workshop in and of itself, but so there are many resources to dive into on the internet, um, including your local extension service to get more um, info specifically on that. Um, Watering, as the days heat up longer from the longer hours of sunshine, you'll want to closely monitor the watering needs of your garden. As Jinky highlighted, you should have set up your watering methods in the early spring. So now you'll need to create that watering schedule for your crops to ensure that they get the amount of water they need as the season progresses and the temperatures increase. Involve volunteers in this task, especially if it's a communal garden space. Notice the rhythm of your garden and when the various plants are thirsty adjust as you go along. And plants will tell you when they are thirsty. Some will dramatically flop over, um, as, you know, very, very dramatically. Um, prepare for possible drought days over the summer, but also conversely adjust for those particular rainy days and don't overwater. Um, and note too that the best time to water is early in the morning to avoid losing water to evaporation, especially during the summer. Water the soil layer, not the leaves, because the roots are gonna drink it up. It's not really gonna come from drinking through the leaves. Um, this will also ensure that the leaves that will get wet, of course, they'll get wet during watering, but it's, um, it's gonna give them time to, time to dry out to prevent those fungal infections from spreading. 
Um, proper watering also is gonna just ensure your harvest bounty at the end of the season. Um, and this is what we want, look at those eggplants. Um, another task you can focus on is nutrient feeding. Feeding your crops with added nutrients and fertilizer is an optional task. It can help you maximize your harvest. <clears throat> you have already amended the soil in your beds in early spring. So it is ready to support the tremendous growth of your fruiting plants. But as the season progresses and your crops are growing, they're feasting on those nutrients and slowly depleting them. Um, if you choose to, we're gonna recommend an organic fertilizer sort of just as a fish emulsion which can be applied as a side dressing to the soil around your plants. Nitrogen is probably gonna be the nutrient most of the high producing, longer growing crops um, that we'll need the most of, but when and how much to apply is completely dependent upon your crop variety. Um, please do the research to understand the needs of each plant that you've chosen and apply, um, don't over fertilize. Again, the local extension service is one option for this information. Um, weeding and garden maintenance. As the sun continues to warm the soil, those weed seeds will begin to germinate, grow, spread. You'll need to remove them growing in and around your plants so not to crowd out and soak up the nutrients meant for your crops. Some weeds are edible, of course, and useful, but they might just be growing in the wrong spot for you. So it's 100% okay to remove them from your garden bed, but let them flourish elsewhere in your garden. Um, regular garden maintenance, such as debris pickup, weeding, raking, can help limit those pests and diseases in your garden. Regular removing the debr debris allows for airflow around the leaves, which further inhibits pests from finding a home. Um, create a, week, a schedule for weekly maintenance and have everyone involved in the garden participate. For school and community gardens, host dedicated cleanup days throughout the growing season. The work will go faster, and the reward will be pretty immediate. Um, so here we are, all your hard work and watchful eyes will result in gardens looking lush during the summer days. It takes a lot of dedicated time, but you will get there. Um, you're just at the beginning of your journey. You'll have, a lot, you'll have a garden that goes from looking barren at the end of winter to looking like these spaces. And the best part will be to enjoy the literal fruits of your labor. Um, it's a joy to taste something you dreamed about in winter and grew all these months. Um, that is such a divine, delicious feeling. And we hope that each of you here today will get to experience it later on in a few months. Um, so here's just sort of a laundry list of some of the resources we mentioned in the discussion, um, as we, you will all get these in the follow-up email for sure. Um, if you're interested, you can dive into our school gardens resource portal right away um, if you don't want to wait for the email. Awesome. That was amazing. Just going to give you guys a clap for just that beautiful presentation. Um, we had so many uh, great questions and so much engagement happening in the chat while you all were presenting. Um, so one question that we do have is someone said, um, how do you, they said that they planted milkweed and now that now that their pots have fungi, there's some type of fungus that's growing. Is there anything that they can do to kind of help mitigate the fungi that's growing in their pots? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly what type of like fungus it is, so I can't say for sure. Um, it sounds like it's on the soil level, the way the question was worded. So um, that's a bit different than if the fungus was growing on the actual leaves of the plant. Um, as far as I know, milkweed is pretty hardy and maybe the fungus won't even be affecting the milkweed that much, in which case you might not have to do that much about it. Um, but it could also be cutting down on, you could try cutting down on the watering. Um, since milkweed is a native plant, it probably doesn't need to be watered a whole bunch. It'll be able to kind of, if you can let the soil dry out, that might reduce the fungus on there. Agreed. Let it dry. Um, you know, we, we love the natives and sometimes we want to help them so much. Um, that we just keep watering and watering and watering. Um, and it's just very, it's just uh, not necessary. Uh, another person asks, 
What is the best way to get rid of aphids? IPM question. Well, I'm a bug lady, so do you want me to- just I know, I was gonna say, you're the one who actually led our IPM <laughs> workshop. <laughs> I was seeing if someone else wanted to jump in on that. <laughs> yeah, so aphids, um, aphids are pretty annoying. Um, I think for me, what works the best is like soapy water, um, really just gets rid of them. Like you, you get like a soapy water solution. I like Dr. Bronner's, but you really could use like whatever soap that you want to, and you put it in a spray bottle with some water. Um, and then you just spray the leaves. And then what you would do, you want to just rub it in. You want to rub the soap into the leaves and kind of let that sit for a little bit. The soap is not going to harm the plant. Um, like nothing's going to happen to the plant. It'll be fine. And then the next day you'll come and you'll water regularly. Um, and then you want to kind of do that throughout the weeks until you don't see any more aphids. The other thing you could do is you could plant something that they like as like a trap crop. So like, you know, aphids really like, we'll use the broccoli as an example. So if you're like, you know, I'll plant a little bit of broccoli in the summer because I know the aphids are going to kind of run over there, maybe put it in a container and let the aphids kind of swarm that. And then you would just take that plant and throw it in the garbage. And then like you basically have like trapped all the aphids. Um, so whichever one you kind of want to do, there are a couple of different things, but soapy water is, is going to save you a lot of time and energy. Nasturtiums and like marigolds, calendula, or, you know, normally you don't eat those, so you can use those as plant traps. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that too. I like nasturtiums. You know, I thought you could eat them and I was eating yeah, them. I was like, okay. Yeah. I was like, why does this not taste? Um, <laughs> it's very peppery. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's like, this is spicy flour. Like, <laughs> okay. We have another question. I said, what would you suggest for nutrient deficient tree beds that haven't grown anything beyond a few weeds over the last several seasons? Compost. <laughs> Add some compost. Uh, there's a few gardens out there where you can get compost, like Red Hook Farms is one if you're in Brooklyn. Uh, just add it to your tree beds. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Um, we really turn it in too. Just don't put it as a top dressing. Really mm -hmm. put it in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of times the soil in those tree beds can get compacted. So mm -hmm. you want to kind of dig in there. Yeah, get the get the chopper, the one with the flat <laughs> head, and, just, and chop it first, and then and then shovel it, and then add the compost, and then kind of just mix it all up together. It's it's gonna be a workout. So like, don't go to the gym that week. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we have someone else that says, how do you keep ladybugs and other beneficials, especially the ones that you brought in your space? My community garden bought ladybugs one year and they flew off. That's a tricky one because you really can't control what a wild <laughs> animal is going to do. Um, but the way that I like to think of it is just trying to create a habitat that they will love and that they want to call home. So I would just plant some more plants that ladybugs really like and that other pollinators really like. Um, there's some mixes that you can buy. I know Hudson Valley Seed Co. and other places they have like a beneficial insect seed mix that is meant to attract those kinds of bugs to your garden. Yeah. And, and I will also put like ladybugs are carnivores. I think we think that they look very cute. So we are like, oh, they're just flying around collecting pollen. Like they need something to eat. So like that person that had like this aphid infestation, if you have an aphid infestation and then you bring ladybugs into the mix, they're going to stay because that's like a buffet for them. So like really think about what it is that they're going to be eating. And like, if you have a high pest uh, area, to put them there. And if you don't, like Laura suggested to really do a pollinator, there's also someone in the chat that said you can also buy wingless ladybugs. Um, I've heard of those. Yeah. yeah. I've never used them. I've also never bought ladybugs. So I'm just, I'm probably I not. Know. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, uh, we do have a question here about slugs. I love talking about slugs. Slugs um, love to drink. They love to drink beer. So you can create like a little beer trap for your slugs. Mm -hmm. um, just take a little dish, a little flat dish, and you fill it up with some beer. And then the slugs will go. You leave it there for the night. And when you come back in the morning, the slugs will be drunk um, in the plate. And then you just you just put them somewhere else. <laughs> so, you know, uh, just throw a party for your slugs if you want to get them out of the garden. Uh, we have another question. How can you handle squirrels and possums in your garden? Uh, my neighbor next door has a giant tree where the squirrels live in the spring and summer months. Go to the 99 cent store and get you some windmills. If you're concerned about the plastic in the windmill and you don't want to stick it in your pot or your garden bed, just frankly stick it right next to the side because the motion will deter the squirrels and the possums. There are also small items called pouncers and you can find them on the internet. They're very inexpensive and they emit very faint sound frequencies. And just that will actually not only deter squirrels and possums, but they'll also deter raccoons. It's also important to remember that at a certain time of the day, it's time for animals to come out. Chantel and I see this often in a few gardens that we steward. So it's really just also important to know when it's their time. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you just have to allow that. Yeah, there's like the, the old saying, like uh, plant one for me, one for you. And one for the <laughs> okay um there was also a, a thing in here someone was saying like so if you have healthy plants that they won't necessarily attract beneficial insects um like asking it as a question like do you necessarily have to have like you know like pests or whatever to attract some of these like beneficial bugs not at all. That's where I think um, a lot of like the flowers and stuff that you plant will, a lot of beneficial insects are just there for the pollen and the nectar from, from the flowers. So, yeah. To piggyback off of that, we've got a question from Aruna about how do you get plants to pollinate in indoor gardening? Great question. Um, Usually, I know growers that have hydroponic systems indoors, you take a little like painting brush or a Q-tip, you go into that flower, get some of that pollen, and then you have to hand pollinate, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just take a brush, Q-tip, go from one flower to another, and that should hopefully <laughs> work. It usually does, and you'll get a fruit out of it. Um, we also had another question about mm -hmm. types of pots, plastic or clay pots. What would you recommend? Um, I think, you know, it kind of depends on what you're going to grow. Colleen, you look like you're about to jump in. So I'm also fighting a cough, so I apologize. Um, I totally agree, Chantelle, with what you were about to say as well. I was just gonna say one basic thing to consider is your clay pot will actually dry out faster than a plastic pot. That's been my experience. Um, and I mostly terrace garden for, for my own home and then work at a school garden. Um, so that's one consideration is you're gonna be your watering. I'm gonna have to mute now. So gonna... <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There's some options too, like, there's metal containers as well. Um, those might get hotter from the sun, so they might dry out a little faster. Um, I do use plastic pots. Um, I, I usually use ones that are like a nice quality plastic, at least, that are BPA free and you can repurpose them. Um, but some people prefer not to grow in plastic, which is totally fair also. It's also important to, again, to consider what you're growing. If you're growing food, you always wanna make sure that what you're growing it in, that vessel is gonna be food safe. Yeah. It's also important to read your seed packet and understand if your pot or your planting vessel needs water or needs to release the water. So make sure you're always aware if your vessel should have holes at the bottom or for some crops that, that want to retain that water, don't have any holes. 
Okay. And even if you're use, using grow bags too, you can use grow bags. Um, the only um, caveat with that is that they do tend to dry out faster, just like the clay pots. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to bring attention to a another question about crop rotation. And so they said for crop rotation, what's the surface area to be concise of? Is it like the exact same spot? Can it be one side of the bed one year and then the other side of the bed the next? That's a great question. Um, usually it's the whole bed, but if you are sectioning off that huge bed, you can rotate that way too but um usually it's the whole bed yeah agreed I think um the issue with like doing like one portion of the bed is is that the plants have very extensive root system um that is traveling underground throughout the entire bed um unless you're planting stuff that are that's very shallow like unless you're just planting lettuce um like and then you want to do another rotation of lettuce like I, I think that's the only way but if you're planting like heavy fruiting crops the 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 root system is going to travel to the other side of the bed even if you're not necessarily planting in that area so I would say to rotate out of that bed um to prevent pests and diseases if you plant on one side of the bed it can also be a little risky that could be the one season that the side you planted on, unfortunately, doesn't yield what you were hoping for. This is a fun question. Rosso is asking, can you use seeds from fruit you eat or is it better to buy seeds? I like to save seeds like every summer. <laughs> I eat my watermelon and I save those seeds. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. They're, you know, free seeds. So use them up. <laughs> Start a lemon tree from your lemon seeds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Laura grew a lemon tree. Laura um, did that. Yeah. <laughs> I think also if you're like, it depends on where you're shopping from. So like if you are getting, you know, fruits and veggies from the market, um, that are heirloom or, you know, the grower and they grew with a lot of um, local practices, like they use IPM techniques um, that we talked about that doesn't like use pesticides and herbicides and like, yes, yeah, save those seeds. Um, and then, you know, it's a little dicey when we get into the supermarket um, because folks can say what they're going to say, but when it comes down to the germination rate, it might not be as high as you want. So, I would say to like really um, go with like vendors that you trust and like farmers that you trust if you're going to save seeds from food that you're eating. Okay, another question and then we're going to wrap soon. Um, so someone asked, um, I've read that most seeds are hybrids and won't grow the same that they need to be bred every year by seed companies that yeah that's related um so that's that's where it comes in handy to know if it's an heirloom like fruit or vegetable that you're saving the seed from if it's a hybrid uh, fruit then it might not produce the same plant um there's also just it depends on the type of plant like with apples you could have um, like a pink lady apple. And if you planted all the seeds in there, they could all grow a different type of apple tree because that's just how apples are. But for a lot of other plants, that's not the case. Like tomatoes, my, my grandfather would keep the same tomatoes that he got from Italy, an heirloom variety. And he would you know start those seeds every year and he would get the same type of heirloom Italian tomato every year. So it depends on the plant. Seed, seed saving and seed keeping is an amazing topic to, to really delve into because there's it's it's so rich. There's so much in there. Yes. And we can add uh, the, the workshop that we did about seed keeping to the additional resources for folks who want to try to save and keep seeds um, from their garden. Um, and then I think last question um, is any information about where to get free compost? Yes. 
There actually is some new info about that. Um, DSNY, if you're, uh, you know, I'll speak to New York City. Um, DSNY, Department of Sanitation, they have compost givebacks. Um, so if you go on their website or if you just type in to your search bar, DSNY compost giveback, they have a whole list of events where they're giving away compost. Some other places, um, sometimes Gowanus Canal Conservancy has free compost, especially if you're a community or school garden. Um, Red Hook Farms sometimes has compost givebacks, Queens Botanic Gardens. So there are a few places around the city that are doing that. Um, you can also see if you have any school or community garden near you that is composting. I know the community garden that I'm a part of down the street, they have their own compost going on and they give back as well certain weeks when, when it's finished. So ask around. And whenever you see a community compost give back, always sign up early because those slots fill up pretty quickly. Yeah, I think Grow NYC is also giving away compost at some of our food sites, food access sites and compost drop off sites. So you can also look on grownyc.org for information on that. Yeah, I will say that the the compost that we're giving away is like very small, like personal small bags. Bag. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I will also say if that you are gonna go to Rahug or Gowanus Canal Conservatory, like to like bring a bag, like bring a bag to like put your compost in. Um, that helps. Sometimes they have bags, but also yeah. sometimes it helps just to like have something. Yeah, and you have to make an appointment with them beforehand. You can't just show up. Show up. Yeah. Agreed. Awesome. Those are all of our questions for today. Great. All right. So I know we probably didn't get to everyone's question, but we will be back tomorrow and Thursday. So please join us um, at 4 p.m. tomorrow for Ancestral Foods and the next day on Thursday for Gardening for Climate Change. And if you do have any other questions or um, any follow-up comments for us, you can send us an email at schoolgardens at grownyc.org. You will also be getting a follow-up email from us with a survey in it because we'd love to hear your thoughts um, uh, on how the workshop was, and we hope to see you tomorrow. So have a great rest of your evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank a good you. one.